Are you having a hard time trying to write that perfect prompt to get the right image from a stable diffusion model? In this video, we're gonna be going over 11 helpful tips to keep in mind when writing prompts. Let's go ahead and dive in. So for our first tip, let's go ahead and talk about how images are. Uh, on their very nature, images can be broken down into core components, such as the subject or the lighting and so on. Whenever you're writing your prompt, you're gonna to wanna to keep that in mind. So I have kind of a template I like to go with every now and again that kind of breaks it down into uh, five key lines. So we have here the subject, lighting, camera, composition, and environment. So I can go ahead and quickly go ahead in here and then just write what it is that I want as my subject, what type of lighting I'm thinking about for this image, and then as far as the camera or kind of effects that I want to get from that image, the composition, and then the, and the environment. And then of course, before I pass it off to the diffusion model, I'm just going to go ahead and remove these helpers and then click generate. So I'll go ahead and do that, click generate, and then see what sort of image I get from the diffusion model. So there we go, perfect. So if you need a little bit more organization when writing a prompt, think about it in separate lines rather than one long string. It might be a little bit more helpful for you. Tip number two, it's important to know the clip model that your stable diffusion model was trained upon. So stable diffusion 1.4 and 1.5 were trained on OpenAI's uh, clip model, whereas 2.0 and 2.1 we're using Lion's uh, clip model. And then the Stable Diffusion XL actually uses a combination of those two clip models. And as a result, whenever trying to generate images with those models, you kind of have to write your prompts a little bit differently. So what do I mean by that? Well, OpenAI's clip model, you have to be a little bit more precise whenever using it. You have to use shorter terms in order to get the right type of image you're looking for. Whereas Lion's clip model is much more expressive. The key takeaway here though, is that whenever you use a model, kind of see if the uh, author of that model has any sample images and kind of look at how they formulate their prompts. If they're very long and expressive or if they're very short, like one person, comma, sidewalk, comma, New York, comma, and so on and so forth, you get the idea. So keep that in mind. And I'm actually going to link to this in the description. I'm not gonna uh, spend too much time on this, but here's actually a demo website that I came across in researching for this video. And so I put in the term cat in a wizard hat and it did an extraordinarily good job of returning those sorts of images within the data set, even if the image didn't have that, those terms as the caption. So we can see here that this one says beautiful Halloween pet costumes, parentheses 23, yet it still returned images, even if they're repeated of a cat in a wizard hat. And then we have much more examples here, but you know, you can kind of go in there and play with it and see what the clip model will return depending on the types of queries that you provide to it. Tip number three is to be specific with your prompt. You know, you can't really be vague when working with stable diffusion models. Cat and wizard hat can mean a lot of different things. Where is the cat? Is it inside or outside? Is it doing anything else? You know, and so on, what's the lighting should be? Whereas if you are very specific, like illustration of a cat and wizard hat, comma, next to a fireplace, comma, golden hour lighting, 8K, so on and so forth, you get the idea. You can be much more specific and that will help the diffusion model kind of generate the image it is that you're looking for. Tip number four, negative prompts. So just as important the actual prompt is when writing it out, so too are the negative prompts. So to go back to our earlier example here, I can see that there's a flower here in the right hand corner and maybe I didn't want that in my original image. Well, to go ahead and remove that, I'm gonna go ahead and just recycle the seed and hopefully we'll generate the same image here, but without the flower. Now I haven't tested this and we'll see what happens. Um, and it looks like it changed the flower to kind of like a red bush, which is great. Uh, now, if we didn't want something red, we could go ahead and further specify that we don't want the color red within the image here. So there we go. We can see how we kind of just quickly iterated on this image to remove certain elements that we didn't want in it. Um, just the, through the use of negative prompts. Now, of course, there are, are other ways such as like in painting, uh, but that's for another video. We're just talking about prompting today. Next up, let's talk about emphasis. So what is it that we're trying to emphasize or de-emphasize in an image? And what if you're using something like Automatic 1111's Web UI, you can actually provide an emphasis on certain terms within your prompt. So here is the official documentation from 
the web UI team here and we can see how they use parentheses brackets and curly brackets to uh, kind of put more attention or take away attention uh, for certain terms within the prompt and in their example here you know they wrapped the term bacon four times in parentheses and basically it's a whole plate of bacon whereas you know they don't do that in these later images and then instead do eggs and you can kind of see how it alters and adds more weight or less weight to the image that you're producing. And they actually have some hard numbers that you can look at as well as you can actually kind of change the amount of weights uh, for the terms in your prompt to whatever it is that you might want when working with your prompt. So tip number six is textual inversions, loras, and poses. So there's a lot to unpack there, but I'm just gonna kind of touch on them briefly. So textual inversions are basically condensed prompts. Uh, you can use things like bad hand, for example, or easy negative. These are two of the more popular ones that are available on Civitai that you can actually download and then put them right into web UI and then generate an image. And it should help the model or at least steer it in the right direction to remove the elements that you might not want whenever generating the outputs. Loras, on the other hand, are very helpful for, say, generating a specific art style or scene uh, that you're looking for when generating images. Um, there might be like, you know, very intricate ones or some that are a little bit more painterly and so on and so forth that you just kind of can't get there with a prompt, but you can use Loras and then add them to your prompt in order to get that type of style. And lastly, ControlNet is a very powerful extension that you can add to Web UI that allows you to basically control the pose of a character um, and then it will, the model will use that as a guide when generating an image. There's lots of different poses, again, available online that you can just go ahead and add to control that and to generate that image. So tip number seven is to go to Civitai and actually copy prompts. Uh, copying prompts is a very helpful way to kind of fill in all the details if you're uncertain right away, if you're still kind of understanding diffusion models and kind of use them as a reference. So how do you copy them? Well, you could copy field by field, but that would actually take kind of a long time and there's a lot of little things that you can miss along the way. If I'm gonna go ahead and pull up this Dream Shaper model page, uh, and so I'm gonna go ahead and click on the eye in the corner here And then there's this little copy button that says copy generation data. I'm gonna go ahead and click copy there And then I'm gonna just remove my old prompt here And then I'm gonna go ahead and paste in all this data and then click this arrow and it actually just filled in everything for me uh, Within web UI and I already have the dream shaper uh, checkpoint here So let's go ahead and generate the image and so based on the seed value and all the other things going on here, it should produce the same image that is on Civitai. And so if we take a look here, here's the image. And then as it's kind of going through the process of the high rise fix, we can see that it is just about there of creating an identical image on my machine locally. So that is a very powerful way to kind of understand what this artist did, if you will, to generate the prompt and then we can kind of make changes along the way. So we'll let this clear out here. It's just kind of, I think the memory, there we go. And so there's our image. And then again, here is the one that's available on Civitai. If I wanted to modify some of this, I could say, you know, instead of a white gown, I could go with black or I could change it from a golden halo to something else and so on and so forth. So you get the idea. You can kind of make little modifications here, regenerate it and kind of see what it is that you might like or not like about the image. Okay, so tip number eight is using the XYZ plot search and replace. I love this feature. So let's go ahead and take a look. We have the XYZ plot, and then if we go here to prompt search and replace. So we could do a cat and a wizard hat, um, but what if we wanted to do say cat, dog, uh, lion, and then generate that. Let's go ahead and see how this would kind of change the, uh, the image, if you will, uh, through different uh, searching and replacing of the words. So here we go. We have now three completely different images of a cat, dog, and lion, all getting swapped out uh, for that term. So basically it's just finding and then searching and replacing it. It's that simple. Uh, so 
you can do this in a lot of ways. So, you know, we just changed the subject really quickly by just changing the terms here. But, you know, you could kind of change around, say, something like the 35 millimeter to, say, an 85 millimeter camera and then to kind of see what type of result you would get with that. You know, take a 3D render with you know, 8K or whatever it might be. And so you can have a lot of fun kind of changing what the image might be with just a simple search and replace. So tip number nine is prompt order. And I kind of spoke about this a little bit earlier, but you know, the terms that are at the start of the prompt are more important and the model will give more weight to those than those at the back of the prompt or at the end of the prompt. So let's go ahead and uh, just see what this means. So if I wanted to change the order of say, cat in a wizard hat in India. So let's see how these two terms kind of change the output of the images. So here's our cat in the head again, and we are using random seed values, so that's kind of important here. And we can see that cat in a hat, or cat in a wizard hat in India, um, kind of changes the image only slightly. There's more of an emphasis on the jungle whenever it comes to India, whereas the cat in the wizard hat at the front of it uh, brings it a little bit more uh, prominence to the subject. But both of them, the differences here are subtle, but if you wanted to kind of change you know, different terms like say symmetrical, we could go ahead and you know see if that does anything as well to the image by just going ahead and regenerating here and then seeing how those two terms slip around might change the output, if anything. Um, and so we can see not too much has changed between those two. While the demonstrations here weren't really too powerful, there might be instances, whereas if you have a really long prompt or a lot of details in that prompt, and you kind of want to see what would happen to that image if you change it around a little bit, prompt order is a good way to kind of test that without having to copy and paste repeatedly. And for tip 10, the last one is going to be the prompt matrix. So just below the XYZ plot, we can go ahead and turn it over to the prompt matrix. And so you can actually go ahead and write right up in here, cat in a hat, or cat in a wizard hat, astronaut helmet. Uh, and then let's go with a uh, race car helmet and see what happens here. I have no idea, but I'm curious to see uh, if we have a wizard hat and we can see there's going to be an astronaut helmet and then a uh, that uh, might be a race car helmet. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with that last one. But we could see though how the prompt matrix can allow us to quickly test right within the, uh, uh, the prompt here, different terms to see how they kind of affect the output. So that's it with writing prompts, at least from my understanding. It's kind of a, an art uh, whenever it comes to writing a prompt because little terms and even typos, which I didn't even touch on actually, can kind of change the output. So make sure you're always spell checking. Uh, so with that, if you guys have any questions, please drop a line in the comment section below. Uh, if you liked the video, please consider hitting that thumbs up button and also subscribing. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.